Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. As Matthew 24 consolidates the fall of Jerusalem and therefore the fall of Rome, the centrality of St. Paul's teaching of the cross comes clearly into view. The glory of God's kingdom can only be present to us through the destruction of human infrastructure and might. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 29 to 31. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 376 of the Bible as Literature podcast, one of the most important things to keep in mind when hearing Matthew's condemnation and threat against both Jerusalem and Rome. The threat against Rome comes in the emasculation of Jerusalem, just like the threat against Caesar comes in the crucifixion of Jesus. When receiving this ominous threat, you must always remember that ultimately, Scripture is a nonviolent text. It's not tearing down Jerusalem in the real world. It's not attacking Rome with horses and chariots. That's the business of Constantine and Julius. It's not the business of the gospel. It is attacking the authority of Julius Caesar in the minds of those in the Roman Empire, Jew or Greek, hearing this story. So that when you hear Matthew 24, you no longer view the authorities in Jerusalem as authoritative. So that when you hear Matthew 24, you no longer consider Caesar your emperor. We have to keep stressing this point so that in 2021, As you are transported back in time to the ancient world to stand with the Jews and the Greek-speaking Romans and the Latin-speaking Romans in order to hear this text, you would, shoulder to shoulder with them, hear the disempowerment and the discreditation of those to whom you give power in this century. It's not about the end of the Roman Empire. It's not about stabbing Julius Caesar in the back and saying, yay, we won. It's about letting Caesar sit on his chair, but not looking to him on his chair as your authority. That is what this apocalyptic imagery is all about, discrediting the incorrect authority. Understanding that the correct authority can only come when this incorrect authority is completely annihilated. And annihilated, not like you said, Father, with a dagger. I mean, annihilated by literally turning the earth inside out. I mean, it is a complete change in what we understand as the world. When we talk about the end of the age, we have trouble translating because age can sometimes be world and sometimes it can be age. It's really just the state of existence that we understand. All of it has to change. All the rules of how society and institution and empire and kingdom and government and rule and power and thought and reason has to turn upside down, inside out. It has to change. This is the root of the metaphor of the part of the human being having to be taken out and replaced with a heart that is inscribed with scripture. The entire brain has to change for the human beings to have a chance 
at following what God is commanding. For the earth to accept the kingdom of heaven, if that's even possible, can only happen if the earth itself is transformed. It's this complete transformation. The blasphemy that comes from this whole passage of Matthew 24 in this tribulation is the blasphemy that some people have that the human beings who have accepted Jesus are going to be transported off of the earth like Star Trek while the earth is changed and then they're going to be transported back down or live in a kingdom exactly as they were when they left the earth because on earth they were already transformed. It's not possible. It's not possible that it's already transformed because that's because it's not transformed. It's still in this earth. It's still subject to the laws of physics of this world, the laws of what power is and how power functions. It just is not possible until there's a true change and you're being transported up to heaven and then transported back or something like that. That's not the change that scripture is talking about here. It's much, much too small-minded when it thinks of what a change is going to come over this world. Change, in a way, is not the right word, although you are absolutely correct in how you've described the function, Richard. The reason change is such a difficult word to use, even though it's applicable, is that when we hear change in 2021, we think about change like politicians and reformers. Like if we make a tweak here and a tweak there, or isn't there value here? Or are you going to throw the baby out with the bathwater? The answer is yes, we're throwing it all out. None of it's redeemable no matter how much it makes sense to you or what value you see. And that's counterintuitive for people, but that's the anti-idolatry school of the Bible. Remember that the crucifixion of Jesus is the execution, psychologically, of Roman religion. It's the execution of their gods. You are executing Caesar when you execute Jesus. And here's the trick. Divine power is only ascendant in the absence of any human power. That means that any human expression that tries to creep in, no matter what we think of it or whether it's valid or not valid, how we characterize it, if you sneak that in, you are voiding the cross. This is a big deal. And this is why religion is always, in the end, corrupted by human hands. Inevitably, Religion is your thing because you are still breathing and you are still interested in whatever happens before martyrdom from your perspective. Scripture is interested in what you do now from its perspective, which is from the other side of martyrdom, in which you don't have an ego. Now, if you tell me, Father Mark, it's impossible for a human being to operate as though they don't have an ego, I'll agree with you. If you then say, well, then why don't we adjust because let's be practical, I won't agree with you because Scripture says what it says. If we can't implement it, that's not Scripture's problem. It's our problem. This is important context because this morning, Richard, you and I were talking about how to characterize all of this apocalyptic imagery from the prophets that we're about to hear. Because invariably... A fundamentalist is going to hear this morning's show and then look at the sky to see when the sun is darkened. But that's not what we're talking about any more than we're talking about bombing cities. I want to keep reminding our listeners of this point until they understand not what we think about the text, but what the text is saying. And the text was saying it before we were born. It's saying it today. And it will say it long after we're gone. That is why in our tradition, when we prepare the offering, the particles for the commemoration of the living and the particles for the commemoration of the dead are in the end mixed together on the patent because our God is the God of the living and the dead. And all of us are united with him and through him to each other by the study of his teaching. We are gathered together at the liturgy on the patent with the Lamb to hear his word. 
Now, if you want to convince me that what that word means is dependent on a particle that came in 2019, then you and I aren't the same religion. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is why I love the Bible. It's also why I love science fiction. Because I like epic stories, Richard, and big explosions. I don't like them in real life. I like them in literature. In literature, they're breathtaking. In real life, they're disgusting. Why it is that way, I don't know. This isn't a psychology program. I'm just telling you, we all like action and drama. And Matthew is using the action and the drama of a number of prophetic texts, drawing on many prophetic images, to express this total destruction, this total annihilation. And remember, the root of annihilation is nihilism. It's the total destruction of everything so that there's a complete vacuum, so that in the end, all that is left is the will of God through the crucifixion of his son. You brought up so many important points, Father, about the crucifixion. Jesus is having to reformat the minds of his disciples because he's about to be crucified. I mean, we only have three and a half chapters left of Matthew. If they're going to understand that their king is still the king even when he's on the cross, they have to go through some quick transformations here in understanding what power is. They ultimately don't make it. We know that. But this is at least... Jesus' last gasp at teaching them, at least if he can't teach his disciples, he's going to leave a teaching for the next generation so that they can understand what this crucifixion means and what this means about how our understanding of power is ultimately nothing. And I also like how you brought up the, the root of annihilation is nihil, which is Latin for nothing. It is creating a nothing, a big zero. Everything you understand is gone 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 nothing zero not rubble not trash nothing and here we have this verse beginning with ephtheos immediately and this comes after all the false christs came and the false teachings the false prophets saying oh look over here look over there and jesus is saying look it's going to be big when you See it happen. It's going to be big. It's going to blow your mind. Everything you understand literally has to change, literally is going to change. I mean, the sun is not going to give light. The moon is not going to give light. Well, then what are the sun and moon if they don't give light? I mean, go back to Genesis 1. That's all they do is give light. So the sun and moon are transformed to their very core and what they are and what they do. If the sun is transformed into what it does and what it is, then think about the earth and, for heaven's sake, the individual humans. Everything has to change. Everything has to be reformatted. If you don't reformat the entire thing, there's still going to be a piece of that virus that's left that's going to infect your hard drive afterwards. It has to be utterly transformed, utterly transformed. Not that what I used to think was good is now bad, and what I used to think is bad is now good, so I used to think it was okay to be unfaithful to my wife, and now I realize it's good for me to be faithful to my wife. No. No, 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 no. That's Hollywood morality. The idea that you get to say anything about faithfulness, that's what transforms. That you have any right to anything besides the duty that's written in Scripture, that's the transformation we're talking about. And none of us really accept that. That's the transformation, the reformatting, the recreation that has to happen. And knowing that it's only possible to be transformed through martyrdom, which is a pretty grim prospect if you take the gospel seriously, it also helps you understand how impactful the gospel was for the Roman slave who was willing to bear witness with his or her life to this teaching. If you understand that, then you realize if you haven't been martyred, you're compromised. And if you're compromised, that means that no matter what you do, there's a part of you 
that still serves something other than the gospel. So as you work each day to receive your daily bread from the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, which is the daily reading, as you work each day to receive and submit to that bread, which gives life, the least you could do is be honest with yourself about what is the will of God and what is all the other stuff. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. This is Ezekiel. It is pure Ezekiel. And one of the first presentations I ever gave as an ordained priest in the local church was on the prophets. I was dealing with Isaiah and also Ezekiel and talking about this, as Father Paul would say, oxymoronic metaphor. I love that expression. Only an Arab could take the word oxymoron and turn it into <laughs> and turn it into a condescending adjective, oxymoronic. What does Father Paul mean when he says that the Son of Man riding upon the clouds is oxymoronic? Well, in the same way that, in fact, the cross is oxymoronic. How can you be a crucified king who loses completely? How can you be a king who comes in glory, kabod, which is the weight of the statue in the temple? Right? There's the weight of the statue in the temple, and there's the hollowed-out tomb. All these things are in tension with each other. So how can something heavy, why heavy? Because when a king goes to war and conquers a city, he brings back treasure and he brings back people. These are the two components of glory. Even now, what does a corporation brag about? It's infrastructure, it's capital, and it's people. And it uses capital and people to build infrastructure. That is the Old Testament conception of glory. So how can something with people and infrastructure that is weighty, that's what kabod is, come on a cloud? How? What are you talking about? It's only possible in science fiction or the Bible. Now, the problem with science fiction is that one of the Star Trek writers will come up with some babble to explain how it was possible through neutrinos and a tachyon field. But there's no neutrinos or tachyon fields in Matthew. So we have to accept that what we are hearing isn't tenable in our fleshly reality. And that should already disassociate us from fundamentalism. In the translation of Uranos in both places, which everywhere else that I've been paying attention, it's been translated as heaven. Here it's translated as sky. But I think it makes a difference if you have the clouds of the heavens versus clouds of the sky, because clouds of the sky are the white things that are floating past, and we think about them bringing rain and that sort of thing. But the clouds of the heavens, the heavens have a different kind of cosmological understanding in Scripture. This is the residence of of God. This is the thing that is opposite to the earth, the thing that's kind of transient and opposite to the earth, which is weighty and heavy, like you said, Father. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of the heavens is really the source of the power and the glory we're talking about. A lot of people are going to read this, and they're going to think, oh, those tribes are definitely going to mourn because they never accepted Jesus. They never accepted Christianity. They never accepted Scripture or whatever, and therefore they are going to mourn. Yet, Scripture says all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn, all of them, including yours. Now, we have this weird theology that some of the Christians are going to be transported and get a reside up in the heavens and get a watch down and see what's happening. You know, they're going to be able to look over Jesus's shoulder when he's coming down to earth or something like this. It doesn't make sense because it contradicts all tribes, all tribes. That's all tribes. 
St. Elizabeth Church is going to mourn when the Son of Man is coming in the clouds. Well, why would we? We're trying to follow Scripture. We're trying to do the right thing, Father. We're trying to just, you know, get by and be as faithful as we can. We know we fall short sometimes, but, you know, we try to do the right thing. Why are we going to mourn? Because you're going to be letting go of everything. I've been reading some teachings of Buddhism these days. One of the things that they talk about as the basis for being a correct human is detachment. And for someone who believes in the cross and understands the cross is the center tenet of Christianity, the center point of the story of the gospel, detachment is anything that brings power, anything that brings glory, anything that brings health and prosperity. You must mourn these things because when Jesus comes, when the Son of Man comes, it's the end of all that. All the stuff that you wanted, all the data you had on your hard drive, it's going to be gone. The whole house that you've been saving all this time and the 401k to help you make the rent in your retirement, it's all gone. It's gone. You will mourn. But the ones who will mourn the least are the ones who are most like Jesus on the cross already because they already have so little to mourn about when they lose it. Mourning is what is so difficult about scripture the reason nobody leads with scripture is because it's self-defeating scripture's agenda isn't to build scripture's agenda isn't progress scripture's agenda isn't anything that we care about from a worldly or fleshly perspective its business is martyrdom its business is the anti-idolatry school of the prophets. Its business is to replace our ways with the Lord's ways and to replace our thoughts with his thoughts. And his thoughts can't be systematized and they don't make sense. That's the problem with philosophy and theology ultimately, is you're trying to make something that is indigestible. Remember the homily of Chrysostom on Pascha indigestible you're trying to make it digestible when the point is that it can't be digested it can't be assimilated all picard had to do was give a copy of the bible to the borg the episode would have been over you can't assimilate this once you just submit to that fact then you let it achieve its agenda and you let it use you like onesimus for its purpose why do I mention Onesimus? Because his name means useful. That's the whole point about slavery in Paul's letters. But what it wants, simply, is to create a context in which people hearing it can live under Caesar without being under Caesar. That's the kingdom. We were talking earlier, Father, about the notion of making sandcastles. That's what we do as human beings, is we create sandcastles. Now, when we're kids, we actually make them out of sand, but then later on we are much more sophisticated and we create cement and steel girders and that sort of thing. We're still building sandcastles. They're all eventually going to crumble, just as everything else has crumbled. Now, earlier people, earlier civilizations, understood this. I had a professor who did a lot of archaeology in Iraq along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and when they would build a house, when the floods came, they would leave, and they would go someplace else, and then when the floods were gone, they would come back. Their house would not be standing. They would build another house. They lived in what would look to us to be sandcastles, but guess what? If there was a flood, it did not ruin their life. They moved and came back. We see the devastation that's caused in Puerto Rico because of hurricanes, because of the way that we have imposed a way of living in permanent houses that causes the problem. There's always been hurricanes in Puerto Rico. And previously, the way they dealt with it is they would move away and they would come back. They would seek shelter someplace else and then come back. They didn't have the attachment that we have now. So, in fact, our civilization, in order for us to be practical, is, in the end, what's going to cause us to mourn the most, because we're going to think that our house is made out of cement, but we're going to see it's just made out of sand. When you go to the beach and a child is building a sandcastle with her friends, and you ask her, is this sandcastle going to last forever? She's going to give you a blank stare. 
If you ask her, what is your plan to preserve this sandcastle in the future after you're gone, she's not going to know what you're talking about. If you ask her, why are you building this? Her answer is going to be, because I'm here with my friends and I'm enjoying myself. If only adults could think about everything they do in this manner, we would be one step closer to possibly hearing the gospel. You don't need a million dollar fund for the future of your sandcastle. Just think about what we're saying. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. There are these elect on the four winds, because it's time to repopulate the earth. I mean, after this next passage, we're going to hear about Noah. Noah was the remnant. Was it because Noah was so good? No, it's because God decided that he wanted to leave a few human beings, which we know because we just said above that God decided to cut short the tribulation so that there would be some people, an elect, that was preserved. We needed some kind of witness that there was a humanity here, and this humanity is going to repopulate the earth. Now, it's not because of virtue. Yes, God decided that Noah was the one. He chose Noah. But we know in the end that Noah was not particularly virtuous, was not particularly good. But that was not the point. The point was the earth needed to be repopulated and refilled with humanity. Now, how this humanity is transformed in the way they need to be transformed, like we were talking about the new heart that was going to be placed in, we have to go back and look at Ezekiel and Jeremiah to see how the individuals had to be transformed in order to have Scripture as their operating system. But yes, there are going to be some people who are going to be repopulating this earth. These are the people in your negative utopia, your post-apocalyptic sci-fi show about a nuclear holocaust triggered by aliens or whatever. These are the people who survive that. And their job is to repopulate, as you said, Dr. Benton, but it's not just about repopulating biologically. Just like Genesis isn't about the dynasty of Cain, although we want it to be. It's about bearing witness to the destruction of the city. That is the seed that you are spreading on the earth. The best way to think of Matthew 24, and environmentalists will love this, but we're not talking about environmentalism. That's another ismos. Just hear what the text is saying. God is going to come and wipe it all out, and we're going to be back to square one. There'll be no city. And you'll be living in the field, in the wilderness, with the shepherd. Not with human infrastructure and borders, but with the earth as God created it from the tohu wabohu. That's what's happening. And I think your reference to Noah and the flood is very insightful, Rich, because it's the same function. It's the same function repeating itself in a different context. Instead of fighting the families of the earth in Genesis, we're fighting the Romans and Jerusalem, and we're wiping it all out so that we can start over with Jesus in the countryside. So the elect aren't righteous, they're not better, they're not pure, they're not saved. They're just leftovers that are assigned a specific duty. And we have to really allow this to sink in because the duty that's assigned to the eclectos here to remind people of the destruction here in the story is the duty that we're trying to carry out now on the podcast is the duty that everyone who takes this text seriously is responsible for, which is to bear witness to the fact that the power in Washington that seems so impregnable and so impressive and so virtuous is not the real power, nor is the power in Moscow or any other weird conception of a pseudo-Christian authority you want to worship. 
the only power that is functional for us is the power of the Son of Man, whose very title diminishes him. Ben Adam, he's ordinary. It is the power of this ordinary man who comes with a glory that can float on the clouds, a glory that allows him to be executed by the Romans. It is that power that holds sway for you. That is what they are to bear witness to. So therefore, why are you building cities towards another glory and another power? This is the basic problem with rapturism. And I want to use the ism because it's another ismos. It's another ideology. Rapturism is interested in elitism and building up the importance of one group of people over another. And that is absolutely in conflict with Matthew 24. Cormac McCarthy's The Road depicts that post-apocalyptic world. And in that world, one's power comes from owning the most number of canned food items. That's the only way you can eat because agriculture has been destroyed. Why has the main character and his child been saved? There's no explanation. His wife died. He survived. There's no explanation why. Why were those people preserved and somebody else not? And some of the people who were preserved out in the world were not good people. They were not nice people. They were selfish people, and they took advantage of others so that they could get more canned goods for themselves. That's how they survived. Let's say you had an apocalypse that destroyed everybody. Well, there'd be no the road. (laughs) There's no story to tell. There's no humans left. You have to have somebody for the story to continue. And the story will continue after the Son of Man comes, but it's going to be a different story with a different plot and a different moral than the story we've been living so far. And this is the end of the age, the end of the story. And there is another story that is to come that comes after the crucifixion. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.